Uh, welcome to our conversation. Our guest today is Dr. Heather Dahan. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so you are a history professor here at Binghamton University? I am. So could you tell me about the sort of classes you, you teach? Okay, I teach um, a mixture of courses on Russia, Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, and also some courses on urban history. Yes, uh, you were actually my modern cities in Europe teacher, and uh, we learned a lot about city development. Good, yeah. Uh, and you actually live here in Binghamton. Well, I do, but only because I work here. So I'm not from Binghamton originally. I'm not even from the USA. Uh -huh. um, I grew up in southern Ontario in a rural area, and I did my graduate work in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. This place is still new to me. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very interesting, especially Binghamton, um, and we talked about in class how it's really divided because of the highway. Um, yeah. is, there, is there anything in your travels or any sort of elements you see that makes a city really great? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a huge question. What makes a great city? Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of literature about this, and, and and most scholars today would accept the ideas that were put forward by Jane Jacobs, um, who wrote a critique of city planning, Robert Moses, New York City, what he was doing, and, and she complained about planners when they try to divide up cities so there are functional zones, right? You have your industrial zone and your residential zone, and your commercial zone, and it all looks tidy and neat when you're the expert, right? And you think about people and you, you map out transport that's going to go from the industrial zone to the residential area. And she preferred pre-planned, more organic, spontaneous cityscapes, mm -hmm. where you would have people who are going to work on the same streets as people who are going out to shop, and the same streets where people, you know, grandmothers are watching over their children. And you get this, this multi-use, uh, complex cityscape, and also a mix of people with different class backgrounds, uh, ethnic backgrounds, right? Mm -hmm. So the people who own the industry are, are using the same streets as the people who work yeah. for that industry. So that's her ideas of what make a great city are, are fundamental to urban planning now, and um, I think they work. Yeah. I think they work. Yeah, I think uh, urban planning is really something that people often don't think about. And it's interesting, you know, some of the social issues we have, whether it's social inequality, um, whether it's, you know, cultural differences that creates conflict. You know, if you, the more you live with certain people and the more you integrate, um, there's a certain community that comes about. Uh, and it's interesting um, how cities can really make or break uh, a country. Because um, a lot of times, uh, cities are where most people live, is where most people spend their time. Yeah, well it is now, yeah. right? <laughs> um, that's a very recent thing. Um, but it's interesting the way you mentioned that cities and the way people live together in cities mm -hmm. can be so fundamental for national harmony, national identity. Um, and I find it interesting because in some ways that's what I'm studying now. Except I'm not studying it in the United States. I'm, I'm looking at Baku, Azerbaijan. Okay. Um, Baku is the capital of Azerbaijan, and it's been in the news because of this war between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Oh, okay. And and most people, when I say I study Azerbaijan, they look at me and they have no idea where it is. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's it's south of Russia, mm -hmm. and north of Iran, mm -hmm. in the Caucasus, which is this you know strip of land that's wedged between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. Um, so Baku, Azerbaijan, it, I look at this in the Soviet period. Mm -hmm. um, Baku was a part of the Russian Empire mm -hmm. already in the early 19th century and then that was absorbed into the Soviet Empire and what's interesting to me is that Baku was a cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. multi-ethnic multi city. Mm -hmm. And um, when the Soviet Union broke apart, many people left Baku. Um, they left to find national homelands that were areas that emerged from the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union had republics within it, an Azerbaijani republic, an Armenian republic, a Russian republic, a Ukrainian republic, but they were all part of one nation. Mm -hmm. And in certain urban centers, like mm -hmm. Baku, people from all those republics, mm -hmm. they lived together, yeah. right? They had shared citizenship, a shared culture and language of a Soviet, heavily Russified, lots of Russian in this. Mm -hmm. um, and they, 
they developed a sense of identity, of the globe, of being world savvy, of being civilized, that really transcended any particular ethnic group. And that's really what I'm studying, both what were the sources of the ethnic harmony, and how deep did it really go? And, and one of the reasons why I want to know how deep that went in that experience is because when the Soviet Union fell apart, yeah. very quickly these people said, well, but I'm not Azerbaijani. Mm -hmm. I belong to the Soviet Union, but by ethnicity I'm Russian, or I'm Tatar, or I'm yeah. Armenian, or I'm Jewish, and they left. Uh -huh. So Baku today is, is an ethnically simple city. It's mostly Azerbaijani. Uh -huh. Baku in the 1970s and 80s, the Azerbaijanis were a minority in their own capital city. Wow. So I like to look at, okay, what, how do people get along, and can I find evidence there already of, of the roots of the violence that followed Soviet collapse, and what do I find in terms of the reality of Soviet friendship? Wow. That story has a lot of parallels to uh, Ukraine and the, uh, you know, annexation of Crimea. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, you have a background in Russian history, of course. Yep. And, um, you know, for our viewers, you look at the situation of Russia, you know, annexing um, Crimea. And you had Crimeans, I think they voted 90% to go back with Russia because they felt that they had an ethnic belonging. And even in the case of Ukrainian conflict, you have the Eastern Bloc where they're the rebels, they feel like, no, we're Russian, you know, and they're closer to that side. And historically, it's kind of funny, uh, the lines have a historical uh, meaning because you had people who were more European on the Western side. Um, so it's very interesting. Uh, yes, very complex. Um, actually, we're doing, my students who are in my Imperial Russia class right now, they're going into the Ukrainian community in Binghamton, mm -hmm. um, and they're starting with the Ukrainian Orthodox um, and Ukrainian Catholic churches, and they're gathering stories of immigration. <laughs> Some people are third generation, second generation, first generation, and it's an interesting project because Ukraine, as we think of it, is a very recent product. Um, so Ukraine, for instance, has, has lands today that used to belong to historic Poland, mm -hmm. that were then taken from historic Poland by Russia, lands that were a part of historic Poland, um, but were never historically a part of Russia. They were first absorbed into the Habsburg Empire, mm -hmm. and then reabsorbed back into Poland, and then swallowed into the Soviet Union, right? Yeah. So it becomes a very messy history. There are people who never identified as Russian, and there are people who were within Russian-controlled territory mm -hmm. from the late 17th century onward. So they have very, very different histories. Okay. And when the Soviet Union expanded westward and absorbed what is now western Ukraine, mm -hmm. they absorbed a region with a very different history. Mm -hmm. um, they actually absorbed it, they treated it as inferior, it wasn't properly Soviet, the people here were capitalist, therefore they were backward. Mm -hmm. They went into a region that had not been, um, that had not benefited from a great deal of investment by Poles or by Habsburgs who are Germans, so they actually didn't have the industry that had already been built in the other part of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So it, Ukraine, you know, from the moment it was constituted, brought together peoples of very different histories. Mm -hmm. um, and you would think all of them would actually resent Soviet or Russian control, yeah. Yeah. but that's, that's not entirely the story. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's much more thorny than that. And yeah. then Crimea becomes its <laughs> yeah. another case again. Yeah, it's very interesting. Most people in Ukraine do speak Russian. And you know, Russia has economic ties. They give them yeah. oil, of course. Yep. And, and to sort of relate it to American politics, you know, uh, Russia is sort of our geopolitical foe in the sense that you know they have their own interests. For example, um, they of course invaded Afghanistan way before we did, and mm -hmm. uh, of course they have an interest in sort of keeping the Syrian. Um, the Syrian president uh, Bashar Assad in power, yeah, and it sort of goes to the Russian culture of sort of you have the oligarchs. They, they're, in a sense, they're the democracy technically, but they're actually not, and it's sort of interesting. Um, through your studies, why have you found that is sort of the cause or, um, for that? Well, you know, Russia has had long-standing geopolitical interests. Many of them were there prior to the formation of the Soviet Union which found itself locked in an ideological battle mm 
with the West, in particular with the United States. And those interests have, they've been remarkably persistent, whether you're looking at a czar, um, the early Soviet Union, which was much more open, well, there was much more internal debate than you found after the 1930s and onwards. You have many of these same interests through the Cold War and then into the post-Cold War period. One of the great um, surprises, I think, when the Cold War ended, there was this idea that now Russian interests and American interests would be the same. Mm, yeah. um, but they, they weren't. One of these areas of conflict has always been NATO expansion, mm, yes. right? So NATO is formed in the early context of the Cold War, and it's specifically to protect Europe, North yeah. America from Soviet expansion, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, we can take this and, and look at Ukraine as an example of this. So that one of the narratives that has been there on Ukraine is always this Russian desire to expand, right? So Russia's an empire and it's hungry to reach out and dominate um, countries in its own backyard. But it's still an open question. It really is an open question as to whether, for instance, Russia would have seized Crimea from Ukraine, mm -hmm. if Russia would be sponsoring separatist groups, if there had been no threat that Ukraine mm -hmm. would join. Yeah, that all started um, actually because the Ukrainian um, pressure, the former president of Ukraine, was ousted yep. and he ran to the Russian side. And what's interesting is sort of the role of nuclear weapons because Ukraine gave away the nuclear weapons That's right. um, so that for whatever reason, um, and this sort of allowed, you know, Russia to sort of invade it. And, you know, um, John Huntsman, a uh, former Republican mm -hmm. candidate, yep. um, he said something very interesting about nuclear weapons. You know, you have places like North Korea, you know, uh, which we don't even touch, you know, because they have nuclear weapons. And it's sort of like um, power, in a sense, um, has to be maintained, you know, in order to maintain your sovereignty. And that's sort of the story of Ukraine, where they sort of gave away some of their powers. What's interesting is the, the arrangement through which Ukraine divested itself as, of its nuclear weapons was something worked out not only with Russian leaders, but also with American leaders. Um, Kazakhstan also had nuclear weapons. And one of the great concerns when the Soviet Union fell apart was then sort of a natural proliferation. Before you had one country with nuclear weapons, now you have three. And in terms of control and security, that did not seem wise to the international community. Mm -hmm. So they worked out these arrangements, and, and these were worked out at a time when I don't think that Russians and Ukrainians imagined necessarily that they would have competing interests uh -huh. as they did. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at that time, Russians believed, and if you actually go back into the hard documentation, you can't find it in writing. Mm -hmm. Although when you speak to both Americans and Russians involved in the negotiations um, with Germany, for instance, and the, the reunification, and they talked about NATO expansion, so many people have this memory of a promise that, that's nowhere written down, yeah. that the U.S. would never expand into former communist, former yeah. Soviet space, mm -hmm. and yet it did. So. It's, it's interesting, you're absolutely right. I mean, what you're, you're pointing to is a betrayal of a promise on the part of Russia, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They were supposed to respect Ukraine's territorial integrity. Yeah. But in their mind, not to say right or wrong, but in their mind, to them that promise, of which the US was a part, mm -hmm. is abrogated by NATO expansion. Mm -hmm. A promise that they thought they received, you know, yeah. NATO expansion would never happen. Yeah. And one, one thing that, that needs to be noted is Crimea hosts the American Black Sea Fleet. Mm. It's an important military asset for Russia, and they, as part of these agreements too, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they received permission to maintain that mm -hmm. off the shore of what was Ukrainian territory. Um, and then with the threat that Ukraine would fall outside of their sphere of influence, they were not willing to take the risk that Ukraine would join NATO or that base would no longer be in their hands. Interesting. So that's part of the discussion. Yeah, yeah it's very it's very complex. And to really tie that in, you spent some time in uh, Iran, I believe? 
Yes. yes. Yeah, but as a tourist. As a tourist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what other countries have you been to? I think uh, you've been sort of a, a traveler. Yeah, I didn't know you knew I went to Iran. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Russia, of course. In post-Soviet space, it's been Azerbaijan mm -hmm. and Georgia and Tajikistan as well. I actually have never been to Ukraine. Oh, I've always been. wanted to go, but yeah. never made it. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, the reason why I bring up Iran is sort of that nuclear conflict is sort of the conflict between, you know, the Middle East is sort of uh, on fire right yeah. now. And you see how, you know, cities also play a great role in sort of, you know, Absolutely. ethnic and uh, religious, you know, differences. Um, so is there any, you probably are well versed in the news, is there any opinion you have in terms of the Middle East or what sort of elements of um, the Russian struggle, Russian-Ukrainian struggle, do you find any similarities in the Middle East? Yes, in the sense that we have a very long-standing Russian geopolitical interest at play. Mm -hmm. um, so Russia, you know, its ally in the Middle East mm -hmm. has been Assad, right? They've also been supporters of Iran mm -hmm. um, and accused of protecting Iran and enabling that nuclear program to go forward, right? They've had fairly friendly relationships there. Um, so then that Iran and Syria, Assad are very close, and to Russia, all of this makes sense. So that they would like to keep Assad in power mm -hmm. um, reflects a geopolitical concern that predates this war, predates them going into Ukraine. The other thing that's interesting is when the war in Syria began, and there was talk in the U.S. and in the U.S. media about giving weapons to rebel groups, the Russians objected. And some of this is the typical geopolitical strategy, right? Yeah. We don't want you to fund rebel groups because you're taking down our men, and we don't see this about democracy versus authoritarianism. We see it as you're taking out our dictator yeah. because you are propping up all of your own in that region, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they did warn, for instance, about weapons going specifically to groups like Al Nusra, mm -hmm. um, and 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 groups that we also know are Al Qaeda breakaways that actually play a role in the trade of weapons and, you know, have facilitated in many ways the rise of ISIS. So they were speaking to true threats and problems on the ground. It wasn't all just cynical, yeah. leave our dictator in place. Yeah. Um, so that, that was an interesting part of, of that back and forth Russian-American tit for tat in the rhetoric over the, the Syrian war in the early years. Interesting. Now, uh, you are from Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, your new prime minister is uh, very popular. Yes, everybody <laughs> loves Justin Trudeau. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Justin Trudeau, you know, he, uh, the famous comment is 2015, you know, he has a very diverse cabinet. Yeah. Um, as a, I don't know if you're still a dual citizen, or um, as a Canadian, um, what are your thoughts on the current state of uh, Canada? It, it's a great question. Um, and I am a dual citizen. I haven't given up my Canadian citizenship, although I am mm -hmm. also an American citizen. Um, I mean, for me, what was most exciting um, for Trudeau coming into power was that Stephen Harper, as one of his tactics to try to hold on to his clout. I mean, there's a lot one can say about Stephen Harper. He was, yeah. you know, uh, severely criticized in the international press just before this election. But he did um, exploit a situation where, you know, we had a Canadian citizen and she wanted to take the vow of citizenship and, and wear mm -hmm. the veil. And he stirred up resistance against that. And to me, I've really read that as trying to use xenophobia, fear of Muslims, fear of the other, mm -hmm. to try to rally the Canadian public behind his cause. Uh -huh. And I was so delighted with that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and Justin Trudeau did the opposite, and he welcomed yeah. in refugees, yeah. right, from from yeah. Syria. So that that was wonderful mm -hmm. in terms of the tone that he's setting for inclusion mm -hmm. and welcome. Yeah. Uh, what he'll be as a leader has yet to be proven. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. he's yeah. he's not been in politics mm -hmm. very long. He yeah. has more of the legacy effect because his father Pierre was so popular. Yeah, that's very interesting how his opponent um, used that xenophobia that, you know, Europe, you know, is now experiencing, especially in Northern Europe. Uh, and even here, you have uh, people like Donald Trump who, you know, use yeah. that, you know, us against them mentality instead of bringing the community together. Um, so you talked about Canada, you know, how about America? Uh, in terms of the, 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 the current, we have a current race right now, 
And uh, you see, you know, certain elements of the Republican Party using that same platform mm -hmm. of uh, xenophobia, of, you know, Muslims, of terrorists, and it's sort of uh, dividing the country. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not a Trump supporter. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure there are many who are here yeah. who are. But I will say that um, Donald Trump is shocking, but not entirely surprising. Mm. In the sense that, you know, coming, coming to the United States from Canada, so I grew up in a rural area. Mm -hmm. I grew up on a dairy farm. Oh, <laughs> and if you go, you know, across the border, the people are very similar culturally. Language is similar. The landscape isn't all that different. Although Southern Ontario was quite flat, at least in the in the Niagara Peninsula where I grew up. But when you go into the countryside, Canada has a base standard of living that's higher. Um, people seem, at least in the vicinity where I grew up, to be more educated, more attuned to um, a public discussion, a public space of discussion that's less fragmented. Right? Yeah. Uh, it's not fragmented like it is here in the United States. So, you know, coming to Binghamton, going through upstate New York, yeah. um, coming to have a summer home yeah. in, in an upstate New York community, and realizing the, the depth of poverty, mm -hmm. the sense of disenfranchisement, mm -hmm. of alienation, and with that, of, of a lot of resentment, you know, at the kind of self congratulatory <laughs> rhetoric you have coming out of cities from the elite, that, that kind of Poverty and disenfranchisement, I think, really lends itself mm -hmm. to support for Donald Trump, mm -hmm. um, to anger at these others who come in, who change whatever this American way is that yeah. you you feel you represent or you identify with. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not surprised. I think this undercurrent of anger mm -hmm. was there, and you could feel it. Yeah, it sort of relates to one of the topics we spoke about. You know, New York City and the Catskills, yeah. <laughs> of how uh, there's a feeling, you know, even if you look at New York in general, demographically, you know, you have Westchester and below, really Democratic, mm -hmm. and past that is, tends to be Republican. And it's really the, the Catskills where we, New York City takes water and sort of imposes their will yeah. on the uh, upstaters. You sort of feel that tension. And it parallels sort of the, the failure of the Congress and the federal government to really understand disenfranchised people. Well, you're alluding to, to what was an interesting story at the heart of that course. Yeah. Um, and I'd actually, I'd like to take that course that I taught on cities and do it again and build more mm -hmm. around um, an exploration of the formation of the New York watershed mm -hmm. and what that represents in terms of power dynamics of, of big cities as opposed to rural hinterlands, right? Yeah. Hinterlands are always, that's where you get your resources from. Yeah. Um, and then also have students spend time in that area, mm -hmm. talking to people, um, and, and coming to be aware of how it is that they are from the city, yeah. right? I, I think we, we imbibe mentalities or identities both consciously and subconsciously when we're from New York City yeah. or when we're from upstate, yeah. and to try to get people to communicate across those divides mm -hmm. would be interesting. And then in that communication, to develop a fuller story of that watershed. Yeah. And, and what it means for New York history, for local history, right? So, yeah. All right. That's very interesting. I feel like Binghamton sort of encompasses that, you know, that experiment. You know, a lot of people come from New York City, come from Long Island, and they come here to Binghamton, which, you yeah. know, all sense and purposes is sort of like a countryside. Yeah. And you sort of see that the university with 17,000 people is really the heartbeat of the city. And the, and the city itself has a lot of poverty has a lot of issues since I've been left. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as a professor and a resident here, yeah. um, uh, is there certain things that you recommend in terms of, I, I definitely agree with you that students being more out there, exploring the city, and sort of seeing different perspectives in a way, that's very beneficial. Just getting a local paper mm -hmm. or walking the street. It's interesting, My I live in an old EJ home, so thinking of, of business that is left, right? It's not just IBM, but it's the 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 demise of the Endicott Johnson Shoe Company. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, have you have you seen these EJ homes? Uh, maybe not yet. Maybe not yet. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, Can you explain what they are for our viewers? <laughs> They're all these were for the most part post World War II buildings. Um, 
there are 1,100 square feet, 1,200 square feet. Um, the, the type that I live in, which you find all over Johnson City and you can find in Binghamton and in Endicott, it's, um, it's two stories. Mm -hmm. And they all are the same shape. Uh, they, they differ a little bit on the exterior. They might have on one house a front porch, on the next house a back porch, on the next house a side porch. Yeah. <laughs> Every so often a house has a hip roof, but they're, they're fundamentally the same design. Mm -hmm. um, and these were built, the story that I've heard, I'm speaking more as a, a, a local resident who hears stories than as yeah. someone who's actually researched this, yeah. um, is that Endicott Johnson hired Italian immigrants, mm -hmm. workers to construct these for workers at his factory who then were given extremely um, low-cost mortgages. You know, at the, people who didn't think about being homeowners could become homeowners and move into these places. Yeah. So I have an, an EJ home, and it's just on the border between Johnson City and Binghamton. Mm. And um, what's interesting is if I go out of my house, walk straight out the front door, and if I go to the right, I walk toward the west side of Binghamton. Mm -hmm. And if I go to the left, I can walk around Floral Park and even go down to the district where the factory buildings used to be and where Binghamton University will put its pharmacy school. Uh -huh. And they're two different walks. Mm -hmm. And they capture two different parts of Binghamton. Mm -hmm. So when I go out my door and I walk to the right, mm -hmm. then I have houses that tend to be bigger. Mm -hmm. They have trees in front. Most people have flower gardens. Mm -hmm. um, many people go out for a stroll. They go out and they walk their dog. But you don't actually see people on their front lawns. Mm. It's, it's, there are just a few houses where people sit on their front porches and they live in public. They have their yeah. conversation in public. Yeah. Most people then they go into their backyard yeah. or they stay indoor uh -huh. and they do their socializing. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're out to garden mm -hmm. and they're out to watch their dogs. Yeah. And if you go the other way and you go toward the, the Johnson City part of town where you have much more rental housing, um, you have much more poverty there. The houses aren't as nice. For some reason, Johnson City doesn't plant trees along the streets, and uh -huh. Binghamton did, I don't know why. Yeah. There's, there, there aren't the same number of trees. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because there, people aren't just out on the street for leisure. Mm -hmm. They live in public mm -hmm. more. Yeah. You find more moms with children on the front porch, mm -hmm. or people who are hanging out, they're conversing, and every time you walk by this house, they're always on that front porch, yeah. right? There's a degree of, they don't have the space for privacy in the same way. Yeah. It captures a very different thing. You go down by the tracks and you see people pushing strollers across the tracks. So you have, you know, these deep disparities in Binghamton. So I, I like where I live because mm -hmm. I don't get lost yeah. in one or the other. Yeah, it's sort of like you're, you're, in, you're in the middle of yeah. everything. And you know, it's a, there's a psychological effect to that, of course. You yeah. know, um, talking about the creation of cities, how you have that perspective of infinity of trees having, oh, yeah. and having <laughs> harmony, and you know, and having I, I believe living in a, a, a good city that's clean, that's you know, that you see that somebody's taking care of it, and even being outside, I think, is important in creating a community. Um, and lastly, um, in terms of being up to university. Um, is there anything that you would, you know, um, encourage students who want to get into Russian studies, or is there any advice you want to give them? Take a course, any course. <laughs> 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 no, I would also encourage broadly. I mean, I teach history. Yeah, I love history. I love what I teach. Yeah. So um, I would never discourage a student from taking history, but most students do. Mm -hmm. um, it's just encouraging them not just to do American. Right? Oh, to yes. not just do that history. Yeah. Um, but I also would really, I like to encourage students to do languages. Mm. Because a language is a gateway to a culture. Oh, yeah, that's true. Right? Mm -hmm. And um, so for Russian studies, take any course, mm -hmm. but also take a language course. And, and people are intimidated, right? Mm -hmm. It's a different alphabet. Yeah. <laughs> um, it has cases which yeah. we no longer have in English. Mm -hmm. But it is also a way into another world, yeah. you know. And for me, actually, I began my interest in Russian history with an interest in that other cultural way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. And I've never, ever regretted yeah. having to learn another language mm 
and enter another culture to do my work. Interesting. Yeah, I think um, that's a very interesting point. Um, and it's sort of like language is the, you have a billion new friends if you learn Chinese, yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> I um, like that way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you. You've been a great guest. Okay, thank and, uh, you. See you next time. Thank, thank you. you.